民主、开放，跟我们现在的当代艺术的创作，更大的一个发展的一个空间。所以我觉得今天我们的大会邀请唐凤政委，他怎么样从一个更开放的一个平台，怎么样去促进台湾更健全的民主？更开放的公民的参与，我相信等一下唐凤政委呢，他会用非常多的实力去大家了解，在网络的世世界里面，让公民的参与更开放、更透明、更多的参与、更多的包容、更多的民主。那在这样的一个世界里面。跟我们的艺术世界的创作到底有什么样的一个连接？甚至在我们的艺术评论的这样子的一个领域里面，怎么去看待这样子的一个趋势，或者是已经是一个事实的一个发展？那我相信呢，今天唐凤政委呢，一定会带给我们非常非常丰富而且精彩的内容。我们是不是就以热烈的掌声欢迎我们的今天的主讲者？唐凤政委。So, um, hello, everyone. Um, around what we call digital social innovation, or as they call it, virtuality and democracy. Yeah. Um, I would uh, first like to note that, as with all my public talks, uh, my content for the next 15 minutes will be crowdsourced. That is to say, you will determine what I talk about. If you have a uh, phone or anything that connects to the great thing that's called the internet, um, the QR code is at the moment a little bit distorted, I'm sure, but that's part of the art. But uh, if the QR code doesn't work, I'm sure you can still go to slido.com, which is S L I D O.com, uh, and the website. Once you're in the website, you can enter the number 01116, which is today's date, uh, prefix it with zero. Uh, and so once you enter 01116 on slido.com, you will get into a virtual democracy uh, space. And in this space, there's two properties. The first property is that it's anonymous by default. You can add your name uh, to your utterances or your questions if you want, but it's by default anonymous. And the second thing is that it is additive. There is nothing to reply to. It's only something to like. So if you see anything that you would like me to talk about or to answer, you can just press like next to it. And once it does that, um, then the question with the most number of likes will just flow to the top for me to see. For example, this one says hello here. And once uh, people have sufficient number of likes, um, the question with the most number of likes will flow to the top, while the newest question will appear on the bottom right of this screen. I'm sure that this projection screen is part of the art, and so please bear with the art. And so um, I'll just begin briefly uh, with some um, prepared slides. Uh, but no, there's already questions. So uh, let's just do questions. Uh, <laughs> yes. So it's the entirety of, of the Q&A on a very interestingly display projector screen. I'm sure this is part of the installation and I'm part of the performative uh, art here. Yes, so the icons on my t-shirt uh, is the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs or known as the Global Goals. And this is something that the United Nations uh, have adopted in the year 2015. After years of consultation, uh, they asked over 1 million people on the planet what is the world that you would like to see in year 2030? And after more than a million people answered the question, the UNDP published a report calling um, the result of the consultation uh, the million voices. And after very um, difficult but uh, ultimately rewarding work, 
they sorted a million voices into 169 uh, global targets. And so those are the global targets that everybody in the UN or outside the UN um, has agreed to get the world to by the year 2030. And those are the um, 17 different categories. It includes no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, and so on and so forth. Uh, my homework is on the partnership protocols, which is the 17th that I'm happy to share about. And the message here says how it can help. It means that not only we're committed um, to adopt the idea of the so-called triple bottom line, there is a beautiful slide that's usually by Jeffrey Sachs um, that um, explains this idea. That is to say, we used to see uh, sustainable economy, sustainable environment, and sustainable society as three different kinds of work. But using the ingenious <coughs> development of the SDGs, they managed to work out a system where any target you work on is guaranteed to reinforce the other 168 targets. And so you can work on any part of the sustainable goals and it will automatically reinforce the work that other people do on the other goals. So it is not controversial in nature and it's reinforcing in nature. And so when we work on a partnership for the goals, I always say that my work as the digital minister, for example, is on 1718, which is enhancing availability of reliable data, on 1717, which is encourage effective partnerships, and on 176, which is open innovation. Now, all these are very abstract ideas, so let me just show you my office and you, you may get some idea. This is my office, literally my office. Um, it is within the C Lab, uh, the Contemporary Culture Lab in Taiwan. It's opened uh, for a year now. Uh, we're just celebrating the anniversary next week. Uh, and so in this space, uh, the Social Innovation Lab part inside the C Lab, it's co-created by one, over 100 social entrepreneurs and social innovators. For example, this software field here, is contributions from people with Down syndrome and social entrepreneurs that has been working with people with Down syndrome for more than 20 years. It turns out that they are special people. Their uh, unique advantage is they think in the language of geometry. While we may think in the language of verbal expression or um, you know uh, numbers or whatever other modalities, they think and look through the world in the lens of a unique geometry, which makes the geometric contributions that they contribute very memorable and make people, when enter the social innovation lab, automatically into a co-creative instead of an extractive or a fighting mode. And so that's people with Down syndrome's unique contribution. There's many other contributions. There's a resident chef. Uh, there's a cafe, there's a restaurant that opens until 11 p.m. every day, including holidays. Uh, and while co-creating, people um, said they want the digital minister, that's me, in charge of social innovation to be here every week. So every Wednesday, I'm literally here from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, actually, yesterday, uh, I stay until 11 p.m. in a collaboration with uh, the artist Zheng Shu Li, uh, part of the uh, biannual uh, project. Uh, we did a uh, sleeping reading called Sleep 79. Uh, I just lay there in a the bed and reading aloud uh, just random sentences for the AI to learn uh, my speech with the written text and uh, like 35 people sleep around me and listen to me just saying one sentence after another with no logical conclusion and we all fall asleep at the end. So that is art for you. <laughs> and it encourages the best from people because then people see digital as not something that is uh, menacing, that is something that's colonial, that's something that is uh, hierarchical, this is something that is people can really, really relate to. And that is the idea of the collaboration for the global goals. Um, all right, so, well, they fix the projection in, like, in real time, uh, or maybe not. Anyway, so, <laughs> right, so um, a person asked question mark, question mark, uh, to which I would ex uh, explain um, exclamation mark and exclamation mark. <laughs> um, so what is the role of the digital minister? That is a great question. So this is a new post uh, set up two years ago, so I'm Taiwan's first digital minister. A little bit about my own background. 
1996, I was 15 years old and just entering the second year of junior high. I discovered this wonderful thing called the Wild Web, and I talked to my teachers and the principal of my junior and high school saying, I can either be reading the textbook created 10 years ago, or I can join the Wild Web and work with researchers to create knowledge that will be in the textbook 10 years later. Because on the Wild Web, people just publish preprints, that is to say, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, even before it gets to the journal. And I discovered I can just email them randomly, and they don't know that I'm just 14 years old, and they don't know that I don't speak English very well. And so I just start research projects randomly with the leading people on artificial intelligence and things like that. And so I just told my teachers, you know, I really want to drop out of junior high, but at that time, uh, it's compulsory education. We will get a, a, a experimental education act just five years later, but at that time, it's still compulsory education. And so my teachers, surprisingly, all agreed with this wonderful vision. And so they faked my attendance record so I don't have to go to school anymore. And so I dropped out of junior high and started uh, quite a few startups uh, working on digital innovation. And so I joined this wonderful internet society and the World Web Consortium and the early internet developers. And we claim that we reject votes and kings and president. We only believe in rough consensus and running code. And this is an anarchistic way of governance. Well, to not scare people, we call it collaborative governance. But that is the first political system that I learned as a 15 years old. And it will be another five years before I get my first voting right uh, and learn about representative democracy, which seems like a very dated and archaic form of democracy at that time to me. And so since then, I've been just applying the lessons I learned as a 15 years old, that is to say radical transparency, all the meetings that I chair, even inside the administration, I publish the full transcript after two weeks into the public internet for everybody to see the why, not just the what of policy making. Voluntary association, meaning I don't give orders, I don't take orders from anyone. I work with the cabinet, not for the cabinet, and all my staff are, I poach one staff from each ministry. So uh, technically I can have 34 colleagues, at the moment I have 22, but they represent different values because different ministry is a different value and they collaboratively govern themselves. I don't give them any orders, nor do I take orders. And finally, it's about location independence, meaning that anywhere I work, like I'm still doing the work of the digital ministry. And so, um, like in the Social Innovation Lab here, we routinely introduce new digital concepts, like this is self-driving vehicles. Now, when people hear about self-driving, people naturally think about drones, think about trucks, think about cars that move very fast and therefore very dangerous. My role as digital minister is to introduce autonomous driving in a way that does no harm at all. Those are self-driving tricycles. They drive really slowly. They don't harm anyone if they run into walls or anything like that. So they come from the MIT Media Lab, but they're open source and open hardware, meaning that people can adapt these to fit their needs. Right next to the sea lab is the Jianguo flower market. There's every weekend people just stroll around the park, the central Da park, go to the Jianguo flower market and buy a lot of orchids or whatever of pots of flowers. But when they do that, especially for the elderly, uh, the burden uh, become like literally a heavy burden uh, once they pick up more pots of flowers. And so the local students designed a workflow where these companion animals, quote unquote, uh, just follow the elders as they stroll along the jingle flower market and they can buy flowers and just put on those things uh, or creatures, depending. And by the end of it, you can just hop on one and it will drive you home. And so that's one very useful workflow that's certainly not going to harm anyone and it doesn't result in loss of jobs or anything like that. And so this, through open innovation, will allow everybody who learn just a little bit about tinkering, about Raspberry Pi or Arduino or those open hardware to change, for example, this flashing red light, which signifies that this uh, car, this self-driving uh, tricycle, is unsure about its environment. But people want to change that into uh, emoji or change to a face of a cat or something that will instinctively get the people nearby into the nonverbal uh, significance of its internal emotion state, quote unquote. And 
all these are what we call social innovation in the sense that it evolves the society and changes the society for better. That too is my work as the digital minister. It's just to introduce the concepts kind of in a sandbox, in a playful mind, in a playful mood, so that people can create something for the betterment of society. And it's also the idea of personal computing because then people can feel pleasant with these technologies. It could be democratized instead of overly relying on its top-down vision from MIT. Two people would like to know, do I think saturation of the internet has shifted the dynamics that I'm talking about? This is a great question, and indeed this is a large question uh, in our current era. The saturation of the internet, I'm sure that um, you don't actually mean the saturation of the fiber optics or the 5G uh, bandwidth because we still have plenty of that. <coughs> People um, is saturated in time and in attention. Uh, the internet has saturated more or less the maximum number of hours that we can spend on it um, nowadays. And so it, it really is a monopolizer of attention in many different uh, scenarios. So to which I have two answers. The first one is all the technologies that we're introducing for democracy, they have a very old name that goes back to the 60s. They're called calm technology. Nowadays we call them assistive or appropriate technology, but it's all the same idea. The idea is that technology should be there to enable people to focus more on each other rather than focusing just on digital apparatus. For example, Slido is a great example because people here just take a glance and know the topic I'm talking about, but then I can just spend all my attention on you people instead of on your phone. And it is also great for long lectures because students nowadays, uh, if you have two hour lectures by the 40 minute or something, they will have an itch to like something or to write something with their phone. Uh, you cannot fight that addiction. It is already well manufactured in their minds. And so I always work with two-hour lectures by having all the students connect to Slido as their very first act. And so by that, I basically make their phone part of the interaction space and not part of their isolation space. So they can still satisfy their addiction of liking something or writing something, except that it is now contributing to the face-to-face -face conversation that we're having instead of distracting people from the conversation. So that's the first answer, is to use technology in a way that is calm, assistive, and appropriate. And the second one is more heavy-handed. Um, I would like to introduce to you this wonderful thing that I install on all my computers and all my browsers. It's called the News Feed Eradicator. Um, it, said, it does what it says on the tin. It eradicates the news feed from Facebook and replaces it with an inspirational quote like this one. True freedom is impossible without a mind made free by discipline from Jay Adler. Uh, and so, in any case, um, it just randomly shows a quote in the place of the newsfeed of Facebook. Because you see, Facebook as social media it has two parts. One part, which is very much like a browser, is intentional. You can enter your friend's name and go to your friend's profile. You can enter a brand name and go to the page. You can do a keyword search. You can do an instant message. You can follow each other. You can start a live stream. You can watch a live stream. It's all very good because it's intentional. You type something, you click something, and then you see something you expect. But Facebook also has another part, which is the addictive manufacturing part, which is the feed. When you open the feed, you never know what they will show you. And when you like something, they, it feeds into a, I would like to say parasitic, but it's, they say it's symbiotic, it's up to debate. But anyway, a personalized AI uh, that maximizes the attention you would put on Facebook. And so, uh, just by liking things randomly, it learns and learns what kind of emotion will make you stay there longer. And so, basically, it gets more and more unpredictable. The only thing predictable is that you will be allured to swipe more and more, and that manufactures the addiction and the dopamine cycle. And so, because of this, I use this feed eradicator in all my social media devices. Uh, and basically use Facebook like a blog, a web blog. And so I'm free of the Facebook addiction simply because I cannot see anything unpredictable from
from the Facebook. On the mobile, there's Tweetless, there's many other solutions, there's Blocker, uh, Ghostery, and there's many other technical solutions, I'm sure. But the important thing is the idea that if we only have intentional interactions, we can free ourselves from the saturation of attention that the addiction that manufacturing cycle is being imposed on us. And I have um, no other criticism of Facebook. I think it's really good as a way to post blogs and share ideas. But this manufacturer addiction part, it is really something that is public wealth, uh, welfare issue. Three people would like me to explain the title of my presentation, which is Forking Democracy. So forking uh, has a uh, well-defined meaning in computer science. It means taking something that is going into one direction, and taking it to another direction, like a fork in the road. But it doesn't negate what's already there. It just takes a copy and brings the copy to a different direction. Now, I understand this is very abstract as well, so I will, again, use an example. Um, the example, uh, as our uh, moderator has already introduced, is the idea of GovZero. Now, uh, all the government websites and services in Taiwan as in gov.tw, and I'm sure it's true in your country as well. Uh, if all as in gov does something or geo does something, right? Uh, and so the idea, very simply put, is this: if you see a government website or service that you don't like, instead of protesting about it, you can create an alternate version of it, and it's very simple. The legislative union, for example, is ly. That's our parliament. The environmental agency EPA, um, the national budget, uh, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. But if you don't like this website or service, if you think it's too top down, too hierarchical, too expert oriented, you just create a shadow version of it by changing the O to a zero, and that's all it takes. And so you don't have to buy advertisements. You don't have to put up your protesting campaigns. All it takes is a meme, is a virus of the mind that tells people whenever you see something in the government you don't like, just change in your browser the O to a zero and you get into the shadow government which works much better. Uh, right, and so just last week actually we announced um, the beginning of GovZero that Italy. So it's the same idea, right? We don't have a trademark or a patent. Anyone around the world can register G0 V that whatever and they start budget Gov Zero Italy, exactly the inaugural project of the Gov Zero. And I hear just this week the Gov Zero that CA is being start, uh, started as well in Canada. So I'm sure it will spread to more places. And so as I said, the inaugural uh, project which is budget G0 VTW now spread to IT, is a visualization of the national budget, which used to be 500 pages of PDF files that nobody really understands in its entirety, except for a few experts. And so, uh, basically, it makes the budget relatable. It visualizes it in a lot of different ways, so you can drill down to the part of the budget that you care about. So the, uh, the part of budget you care may be just one of the 1,300 ministerial projects, but maybe you just only, only really care about that particular one. And then for that one, it turns itself into a social object. That is to say, a link around which people can say, oh, I want this budget to be allocated more. I don't understand this budget. I want to cut this budget or reduce it somehow. And the interesting thing is, um, when it's first proposed in 2012, uh, and the first project of Gov Zero before I joined in 2013, um, it was seen as such a good idea that by the end of 2014, uh, a lot of mayors decided to adopt this as their participatory budget visualization platform as that spread to more than six, I think it's eight now, municipalities and cities in Taiwan to power their participatory budgeting platforms. And by the year 2017, uh, I personally merged this fork into our National Development Council so that now if you go to join.gov.tw, which is not got zero anymore, uh, you can see a visualization of all the 1300 projects of the ministry. And it works exactly like uh, the Gov Zero introduced it in 2012 for one difference. The only difference is that this time around, in all the 1300 projects, if you publicly ask something, 
the public service will actually answer to you. So before it is a conversation among the communities, but now the public service commits ourselves to provide a timely answer publicly on any part of the budget. You don't have to go through a minister or an MP or a counselor. Anyone can just pose a public question and for the public service to respond publicly about the budget. And so this is the fork in democracy and this is basically the idea of a standby government. It's like standby coffee. Uh, and when the government is ready, because they've got zero people, or relinquish our copyright, the government can merge it at any time into the GOV service. And so this is partnership initiated by the social sector. <clears throat> Three people would like to what is the value of knowing how to code and what is the best way for someone to learn how to code? This is a great question. Um, so code is law, as uh, Professor Lessig uh, likes to say, but um, maybe he forgot to mention it is not textual law, it is more like physical law. Because on the cyberspace, code determines what is possible and what is not, what is transparent and what is opaque what gets spread around and what gets isolated. And so these are like the laws of physics, <coughs> except, of course, we can make ones ourselves. <coughs> so they are followed automatically. If they need no interpretation, and that is the difference between code as physical law and the textual normativity. That is our legal code. Uh, part of my work as digital minister, again, is to make sure these two normativity modes can translate into one another seamlessly. I would not pretend this is an easy task, but we're getting better at it. So the uh, good thing knowing how to code is exactly as the good thing about learning a little bit about your civic rights, learning a little bit about your process, learning a little bit about the rule of law. Not anyone need to be a lawmaker, but it is utmost importance in a democracy if we have a lot of people knowing a little bit about their rights and about how the law works. This is of utmost importance. Otherwise, if we only have a handful of people who knows about law and everybody is ignorant, then we essentially have a dictatorship, even though it's framed as a democracy, because then it's up to these small number of people to interpret and apply the law. And it is the same with code. If everybody has a little bit of familiarity of how computer works, the people stop seeing things as a black box, as a mystique, but rather just like uh, the paralegal profession, the civics uh, teacher and things like that, uh, when you need to learn something, you always know who else in the community to ask to, then not everybody need to be constitutional court judges or lawmakers or system programmers, but everybody can get some familiarity of the extent of possibility that is law and code. What's the best way for someone to learn how to code? Um, I coined a term uh, more than 10 years ago that says optimize for fun, uh, meaning that learning code should be motivated by a curiosity. Now, for uh, preschoolers and early uh, primary school uh, level, we have a great invention also from MIT uh, called Scratch that lets them just put together like Lego bricks uh, and they can very easily make uh, things without even uh, learning how to write. Uh, so this is great, this is good for uh, children of all ages. And they don't have to start from a blank canvas, so to speak. They can start from some visual, interactive, musical exposition that is powered by code and just change one note in it, one color in it, one palette, one brush, and they see that code is something that's inherently in the commons, meaning that everybody can take something away make their own version, but without actually reducing the value from the original creator. That is to say, it is not like a tangible asset, but rather it is like the commons that we can all share. And it suffers from no tragedy of commons, because when you fork something, it doesn't actually take the original thing away. And so this, I think, is both a uh, artful intervention, but also a important um, cultural and philosophical intervention that people learn how to code through things like Scratch. But of course, for grown-ups, um, pure 
uh, curiosity. I mean, for me, it still works, but for many other people, uh, they're inclined with um, their duties to the family, for example, or their duties to the work and things like that. And so, code, if you want to optimize for fun, it needs to first relieve you from some burden that you are currently suffering from life. And so I have a friend, Linda Lucas, uh, who runs this Real Girls uh, workshop that teaches women uh, how to code by co-learning with them to look at one particular practical life issue and use code to make things better. And so if you have a special purpose and learn specifically to solve that issue, to deliver that purpose, actually it only takes a couple of weeks to achieve a single thing. But on, on the other hand, if you read about the entire vocabulary before even writing your first essay, that takes years, of course. So one of the examples is that there was a, a young mother who attended Linda's classes, and she said, when asked that what is the most pressing um, you know, social obligation that currently uh, troubles you, she said, oh, I have a young kid, and the child suffers from separation anxiety. Whenever the mother goes to the grocery store or somewhere nearby, even just uh, for a walk, the child just cries, and no matter what other caretakers do, uh, the child would not stop crying until the mother goes back home. And that is her uh, current uh, burden uh, on the family. Uh, so she has to carry her child everywhere, uh, including to coding classes. Uh, and then uh, Linda and the uh, classmates devised a very simple device uh, and it's just like an art installation. Actually, maybe you saw it on elevator, right? Uh, and there's a clock there that's just LED screen, right? It's very simple LED screen that displays five numbers. It's very simple uh, hardware. And because the uh, mother uh, wears a Fitbit or something that tracks the number of steps um, and personally, for personal health reasons, so that's perfect because it sends exactly how many steps she's taking from which direction. And so within two weeks, she learned to code a very simple Arduino system open hardware that shows exactly how many steps the mother is from home. And so the child can look at the screen and see that mom is exactly uh, 200 steps from home. 100 steps, 50 steps, 30 steps, two, two steps, and then the door will open. And magically, it just cures the child of separation anxiety. The child just learned to how to count down. And once the countdown finishes, the mother is guaranteed to appear at the door. And so that frees so much of her time, and she learned only two weeks of programming to get there. So once you have a pressing social purpose, you can all learn coding really, really quickly. <laughs> but if you don't have a pressing social uh, purpose, and you want to learn as a generalist, of course, that takes years of education. So my suggestion to the second part of the question is just to find something that really troubles you and ask your coding friends how their skill can make your life better. Um, what do I think about cyber love? Uh, this is a uh, question that I can spend hours talking about. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, um, I think cyber love is one of the more interesting things <laughs> um, that uh, people here um, can um, relate to because um, it reduces, um, both reduces and amplifies uh, the humanity uh, in each of us. Um, I, I always use this um, diagram to describe the bad old days uh, of governance before the internet. Uh, people will apply pressure to the Minister of Economy on one side and the Minister of Environment on the other side. Uh, or for example, uh, the Minister of Financial Development on one side and Minister for uh, Social Welfare on the other side. I can think of many other pairs. Uh, so, uh, but the road here is the career public service. They're invisible, but they suffer all the pain and tension, and they have to somehow arbitrate and make something that um, make everybody not happy, but at least sacrifice um, an equal amount. So this is the bad of days. Uh, and relationship before cyberspace is like that, right? If you uh, live in long distance and uh, have to uh, rely on very thin bandwidth uh, to communicate, it is a little bit like that. And the dynamic between the lovers will be constantly about one party moving to the place of the other party, and it's very, very difficult to maintain a long-distance relationship, um, just as it was really, really difficult to reconcile the activists from the different camps. 
But now, uh, with the internet, we have the promise, not, not the full delivery, the promise of a um, more collaborative way of um, policy making. And I'm sure love making as well, but policy making. Uh, so <laughs> the, in collaborative governance, um, basically, we don't ask who are the organizers and who make the judgments. We don't ask those two questions. Because remember, people don't need the ministers and councillors and MPs to organize anymore with the right hashtag, like hashtag me too. Hundreds of thousand people just organize out of nowhere. So they don't need ministers as organizers anymore. And there's just so too many emerging hashtags. We cannot make one new ministry for each hashtag. <laughs> it will break the governance system, right? And so instead we ask, given our very different positions and stakes, are there some common values after all, right? So the SDGs, the global goals, these are 17 common values. But are there some common values after all? And once we discover the some common values, can we, as the government, look at our policy and regulations and see what are blocking those values from truly realizing? Because otherwise, it's co a coordination problem. Um, things work bad because it's in a national equ equilibrium. Anyone moves, it doesn't make things better. It only makes things better when everybody coordinates and moves together. It is like crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. And so just by creating an open space to make sure everybody can see each other's feelings and positions, uh, people can coordinate and move together and into a new, better Nash equilibrium. And that is the value of collaborative governance and the value of the sandbox system. So to me, uh, several love are kind of like in this transitional space. Um, it makes, of course, the relationship still meaningful even across distances, but it also uh, prompts, of course, a possibility of people actually moving in together without breaking their relationships over uh, long distances. So I see it as a transition into physical relationship. I don't see it as a goal, a um, end terminal in itself, but it does create a possibility space that is otherwise not there and uh, the lover will be uh, in this position, which is a much worse position than previously. Um, three people would like to know, do I feel that the digital anarchism and we're engaged in our why what is still possible in 2018? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, actually, the, the Internet Society, the ICANN, the IETF, the um, rule makers of the Internet, um, when I joined, uh, they, we don't call the, our output laws, by the way, we call ourselves the output RFCs or requests for comments were very humble, you see. So the requests for comments were the physical laws and protocols that define the internet. And the internet is inter in the sense that everybody is free to participate or they're free to disconnect. And the internet has no army and no navy. So we cannot force anyone to join the internet. But people joined anyway. And because they know that through radical transparency and voluntary association, anyone who think of anything on the internet, they can innovate without getting permission. And if they think they're a stakeholder, claim to be a stakeholder, if they have an email address, everybody can partake in the rulemaking policy uh, internet governance system, even if they're just 14 years old, nobody knows they're 14 years old anyway. And so that is the core promise of the internet. And today, in 2018, that's only reinforced the internet today has more sovereignty, so to speak, uh, compared to 1996. In 1996, the Internet Foundation Society still reports to the economy ministry of the United States, but after the Snowden incident, uh, it became independent of the United States. At that time, there was a lot of pressure for the United Nations ITU to absorb the Internet governance system. But now, uh, the Internet governance system agreed to hold an Internet governance forum every year in conjunction with the UN um, ITU in Geneva last year, for example, which I participated um, through telepresence. Uh, I just drove a robot to the United Nations in Geneva, uh, and the robot just speaks uh, with a live stream, a video, and audio. Um, and so the robot doesn't need a passport that solves a logistical problem for us. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, for, for all the matters.
directors of the UN Secretariat, uh, they're just watching a movie, uh, even though the movie is recorded two seconds ago. Um, and so basically, that is a really interesting way for us to participate in UN meetings. Uh, I've done that actually many, many times, but in UN IGF, that's live streamed, so um, people know about it. <laughs> but, but so far, actually, people are generally fine, because I'm just talking about sustainable development goals through telepresence, and so people generally accepted that that's the digital minister. So now you're talking with the analog version of the digital minister, and the digital minister is usually digital. Uh, and so, <laughs> uh, okay. um, so, yes, so the basic premise is that today the internet is still free. Uh, today, everybody can still join internet governance. The internet is as a sovereign. It doesn't respond to either the states or the United Nations. Um, so it is within our duty, I think, um, as early cyberspace participants to keep things this way and also to project the values of the early internet into more areas of governance. Um, six people would like to know, what do I think of the post-internet culture? This is a great, great question. Um, there was uh, a, a new idea called Internet of Things. Um, it, it is now an old idea, but it used to be new. So the IoT says that uh, people are currently using the Internet, but very soon our refrigerators, our microwave ovens, and whatever are going to the, be the main users of the Internet. They will talk among themselves. Um, if your answering machine is out of capacity, your refrigerator will answer the call. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But basically, the idea is that, is that uh, the, the things are supposed to connect together, uh, and uh, people will enter a post-internet culture because the internet will be back uh, to be handled by the things. It will just to be so even in the social environmental fabric that we stop thinking the internet as the internet and just enjoy this fully automated. Um, loving care by the all-seeing machines, whatever vision, uh, which is very dystopian and actually from my uh, point of view is the, one of the most dangerous uh, viewpoints around. Uh, it has a name even, it has a name called Singularity. You might have heard of it. Uh, the idea is that the Internet of Things will accelerate so quickly that it will grow beyond human comprehension and at the end of it will just, uh, I don't know, um, oil in the ma matrix or something like that. Uh, it is a really, really dystopian future. But fortunately, things don't have to be this way. Um, we can actually learn with the machines and have the machines co-domesticate with us. Um, I, I think this, again, uh, I, I have um, lived with many companion animals, for the record, like with three dogs and seven cats, so I always use co-domestication as an example. So, for example, if we co-domesticate with these uh, beings, we as humanity also learn something, right? Uh, anthropologists and archaeologists tell us that we learned how to follow each other's gaze, how to uh, hear a wolf's cry and know its nonverbal uh, state of mind, and we learn how to point and look with the dogs. We actually learned from the early wolves. Uh, the early hominids co-evolved the social traits uh, with dogs, basically. Uh, and that enables us to become more social and therefore more caring human beings. So there's something that we can learn together, but it's only if we phrase and frame these creatures in a way that are participants in the society rather than overlords of the society. So um, I'm going to read you some poetry because two years ago when I joined the cabinet, they asked me to write a job description for as a digital minister. Uh, I've never written job descriptions before. <laughs> and at the time I was in Wellington, I was talking with some Maori people. Uh, the Maori people, uh, maybe some of you already know, uh, culturally they think Taiwan is their root, uh, their ancestors of the Austronesian uh, culture. Because while at the west side of Taiwan, there's a lot of ethnic Han and Western democratic um, society, on the eastern side, there is a, a longer culture, 4,000 years or more, of Austronesian uh, and 16 indigenous nations uh, that are asserting their rights and their full uh, sovereign. Also, as we speak, it's called transitional justice. Uh, but they are the route uh, that sailed all the way um, to the, to the seas, actually to Madagascar on, the, on this side and uh, to the east. 
And certainly their culture, their language traveled even wider, uh, all the way to the Maori people. And so people who are of Austronesian origin uh, think Taiwan as the origin of their culture. So when I was there and talking with the Maori people about our shared uh, roots and their shared roots of Taiwan, I was really deeply touched of how constitutionally in New Zealand, because their constitution is really a treaty between the Western democracy and the Maori people, uh, they allow, for example, a river to assume personhood. Uh, there's a river in New Zealand that is now a legal person. They can sit in the board of a chair and they can uh, participate in corporate governance. Uh, of course, it's represented or represented uh, by someone from the Crown and someone from the Maori, but what's important is that it can exercise full legal rights. If you harm the river, it can actually sue for harm. And this is actually something that the Australian culture brings uh, to the sustainability discourse that I think is very, very cherished. And so when they asked me to write a job description, I just followed in the style of Maori uh, poetry, and this is my job description. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always keep in mind and always remember that a plurality is here. Thank you very much. in such a way that everybody can only have it and not take away 
that, that people can contribute but not delete. Um, and in, for example, distributed ledger, the code itself ensures that you cannot take anything away. And so in a purely additive environment, I think people's sense of time changes because people want to uh, separate the short form from the long form, mostly because the time is seen as a scarce uh, resource and that anything that's tangible corrodes with time. And these are kind of uh, the two invariants that we're working with as materials uh, in the space time. But now in cyberspace, none of these two actually holds. Um, it doesn't uh, degrade over time, it only grows over time. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that the short form and the long form um, is hyperlinked together. A long form Wikipedia article is actually a link between many, many, many small edits. And so anything that is cross-generational, as long as the sustainability promise, that is to say we don't burn through more than one us here per us here, as long as we hold to that promise, our next generation will actually um, have a lot more to create with instead of uh, to create uh, from. And that is a very, very different position compared to the previous generations. Now, I'm, I understand actually copyright and things like that actually makes this kind of hard because you have to wait a really long time before you can use something, which is why in Wikipedia and other places we use what we call Creative Commons or CC to share our copyright so that people can right now instead of uh, waiting for me to die and wait for another 50 or 70 years. Um, and so I think this time frame is um, kind of eternal if you just share your copyright uh, immediately. But at the moment it's a little bit segmented if you have to follow the normal copyright rules. And that is the normal copyright rules that reduces one to one's lifespan plus a number of years. And it's within this limited time that people will separate the short attention span forms and the long attention span forms. So for me there really is no difference because all my work is in the public domain. I, I relinquish my right soon as I finish creating it. So there's no I in it. And it is basically I become a part of the crowd that is part of the collective intelligence and that to me is a truly long term view. We, we have time for one more question. There's a microphone underneath your seat. Um, I'd like so so uh, and and press if you press this microphone once. You can speak into it. Remember to turn it off again after the finish asking the question. Oh, and stay seated because it's not long enough for you to stand. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. It was just mind blowing, and um, I'm so glad that I appeared from Australia. And my name is Mia, and I'm a visual artist. Um, I'm just wondering um, what you think the role of domesticated and wild animals might be in the virtual world. What's the main Do you think there might be any kind of role, or like what, what would um, What's, what, how would animals uh, be part of the virtual kind of... Like, what, what's the role of domestic animals in our digital yes. future? Yes. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, and we will take the other question. Uh, yeah. um, Frank, can you just offer your thoughts about the various manipulations of the internet toward the goals of censorship? Uh, disinformation, racism, you know, the, the, that are very current today uh, throughout the world. Well, I can easily spend another two hours talking about these two subjects, um, but let me just be really, really uh, brief. Uh, and the disinformation one is the easy one, so I will answer that first. And the domestic animal one is kind of uh, the really, really philosophically interesting one, so I will answer uh, next. The disinformation one <clears throat> is, is really easy, actually, to solve. Um, the idea, very simply put, is to hold spaces around which that people can have a meaningful conversation. 
in a way that only adds and not subtracts anything in the way. So for example, in Taiwan, we regularly use AI-powered conversation called POLIS. This is entirely open source. And we started using it in 2015 uh, when UberX first operates in Taiwan. But we now reduce it regularly for all kinds of emerging uh, issues. And so in this design, you're in the middle when you enter and you see all your different Facebook and Twitter friends uh, in different positions around one particular issue. And you can move among your uh, people. But the important thing here is that you see people with different positions, not as nameless, faceless enemies. They are, in fact, your friends and families. Maybe you just didn't talk about this public issue over dinner. That's the first contribution. And the second one is that we crowdsource the facts, the evidences. So when we call it open data, it's not just open government data, it's open citizen science data as well. And so given the facts, we dedicate a month, at least three weeks, to feelings. And this AI power conversation asks nothing except what do you feel about it. We ask people to begin their statement with what you do, which means I feel that, I feel something. And there's no right or wrong in feelings. Around the same fact, you can feel doubtful, I can feel happy, and it's all okay. It's only when we set aside one period for feeling do we move on to ideation, and the best idea are the one that take care of the most people's feelings. And then we make decisions. And so it works in practice like this. You get a link, and then you see yourself here. You see a fellow citizen and their feelings, and you can resonate or not resonate with their feelings. And as you do so, your position will move. But then, as you can see, there is no reply button. In all the platforms that I introduced, join the GOV, the slider we use today, in the POLIS system here, if there's one thing in common, there is no reply button. Because if we see a reply button, people actually attack each other. They take away from each other's credibility. They post cat pictures, and that's the better part. Uh, they post other pictures as well. And in any case, it detracts from the conversation. But if you don't have a reply button, after clicking agree or disagree for a few times, you will be motivated into thinking something that people can resonate with. So people are still competitive in a sense, but they compete to bring eclectic, nuanced statements that everybody across the aisle can resonate with. And so at the end of it, we always see this shape. This is an experiment they did in Bowling Green Assembly in the US, but we also see the same shape in Taiwan. If you only see mainstream media or even some social media, you will think those five positions are all there is. It is a fake per per perception of uh, polarization. But that is actually not true. It is an illusion that is created by attention craving uh, media uh, outlets, that's, and especially on the uh, social media, but also on mainstream media. So there's an incentive to only talk about those five things. But when we run uh, feeling collection uh, consultations like this, people spend far more energy actually learning that no matter their parties, no matter their ideological predilection or whatever, they actually all agree on a lot of things. And then we just use these as the policy making guide uh, going forward. And so the answer to your question is very simple, is that if we can regularly show the why and everyday work that I do, if you can just meet me every Wednesday in my office hour, there is no room for rumor to spread. Just as if you have a really good friend that you meet for a movie or a dinner, um, and a couple of times a week if you hear about gossip, uh, about that friend, you will not actually share it, you will check with that friend. And it is only when uh, we get so separated that we don't have a open and radically transparent relationship do the disinformation have room to grow. And this, the way to check our feelings, are like inoculation that makes uh, those so-called viral ideas in its less viral and more nuanced form that gets everybody into the habit of listening to each other's feelings. And so this is the answer to your question, the short answer anyway. Um, and about domestic animals and animals' um, role, this is a fascinating question. Um, so I, I actually work in virtual reality to uh, do consultations. Um, so for example, even after I become the digital minister, I work with the Hangzhou uh, Academy of Arts uh, and the Kaohsiung uh, Graduate uh, Institute of Arts. Uh, we uh, 3D modeled their classrooms, uh, put it together, uploaded it to virtual reality into a data center in Zhanghua, and I'm in Taipei uh, wearing a virtual reality class. 
and the end result is that people in the three places where we put on goggles, well, it's open for everybody. So when we put on the, the VR goggles, the empty chairs, suddenly you see students from the other classroom uh, appearing on those empty chairs, and we can have a real conversation that scales tens of thousands of people together in virtual reality. And I tried this experiment even with primary school uh, children. And when we talk about, for example, their uh, playground and things like that, my avatar is at the same height as the primary school children. And so they see me as someone they can relate. They don't have to look up to me. They can just uh, relate me as one of their fellow um, primary school children beings. And I think this is really one of the more promising way to talk about animals and their role in the environment. If we talk about endangered animals in a construction, it helps everybody if we can put on VR and immerse ourselves from the experience of a protected animal in that region. When we do a park, it helps to have at least some people experience two minutes of time as a stray dog in that region and things like that. So when we talk about empathy, we're really talking about stepping into each other's shoes or feet or whatever, or first, uh, but in a way that is truly immersive and that accurately portray the lived-in experience, the embodied experience of that fellow being. And so that is my short answer. Uh, it is, it's getting harder when you talk about a river, a soul of a river and things like that, but even that we're working on that as well. So if you're interested in that particular line of research, uh, we actually have a lot of artists at the moment, uh, working with my office uh, in Madrid, uh, of all places, um, um, what we call Holopolis, which uh, the uh, open source conversation uh, interface I introduced is called Polis, and this is called Holopolis, and Holopolis is explicitly bringing the possibilities of an extended immersive experience from animals and bots and mixed reality into the possible realm of immersive consultations and deliberation. And if you're interested, I'm very happy to work with any filmmakers, choreographers, <laughs> anyone who can immerse ourselves from the viewpoint of an animal when we talk about public construction. So thank you for the great question.我必须要很残忍的10 minutes.